Big Break Podcast, where we delve into the rich history of jazz to celebrate artists, entrepreneurs, and jazz enthusiasts alike. Join our host, Dr. Dina Bennett, well-known ethnomusicologist and executive director of the American Jazz Museum, on a journey into the stories behind the art. Let's go. Welcome to the American Jazz Museum's Big Break Podcast. I'm Dr. Dina Bennett, the executive director of the American Jazz Museum. And with me today is Gerald Dunn, director of entertainment for the American Jazz Museum, musician extraordinaire, and also a really adept businessman. Wow. Uh, that means I want to get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> Introduction like this. Oh, you can cut that out. though. <laughs> So, Gerald, tell me a little bit about what inspired you to become a musician. I grew up in uh, a musical family and had a chance to um, listen to a lot of relatives play music, sing music, and uh, I really had no choice, to be honest. Okay, but tell me why you chose your instrument of choice. Oh, the why? Mm-hmm. Actually, I started out on drums and um, fast forward to sixth grade and they uh, gave us a choice to uh, choose instruments and I didn't want to stick with the drums. I wanted to uh, go to an instrument that I didn't know how to play and I scored high enough on the test that they give students. Well, they gave students at that time and I was allowed to choose the instrument that I wanted to play and saxophone became that instrument. So I know that being a musician or being an artist requires a lot of discipline. And can you tell me what kind of discipline or strengths do you have that you believe make you a great musician? Because I know that you play with a group in town and, you know, you've played different venues and you're in, you're in high demand. So it's sort of like a loaded question, uh, biting my tongue here because uh, when it comes to discipline, a lot of times I feel that uh, I don't have as much. But when you'd like to uh, uh, have a certain outcome on um, people's reactions to your music and uh, just wanting to sound good, it, there's no other way to do it than to uh, get in the room and practice and practice on the things that you don't know how to do. A lot of times we get caught up in um, practicing on the things that we know how to do just for our egos. And um, when you get out to perform, you know, you hear people repeating themselves over and over and maybe they're not as proficient on their instrument. But when you recognize that you have a flaw in your playing, it's up to you to be the judge and to decide um, whether or not it's time to take yourself to the mat and uh, work those issues out. And I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of people in my life that uh, kept me grounded and still keep me grounded. And that's why I like to surround myself around people that are better than I am. Um, and sometimes they're brutally honest. But in this field, um, if you want to be among some of the uh, well-known performers, you kind of have to you have to stand the test and get in there and get knocked around a bit. And uh, in the end, it, it turns out pretty good. It turns out pretty good. All, everybody's gone through the same process. Uh, the Lonnie McFadden's, the Bobby, the Bobby Watson's, um, uh, the Mary Lou Williams, Count Basie's, Charlie Parks, everybody has gone, have gone through the same process. There is no shortcut. I wish there was a pill that you could take, but there's no shortcut. It's just getting in and going in and figuring out. Middle C on the piano has always been middle C. It's never changed. And so it's just a matter of just getting in and memorizing and understanding harmonies. So who are some of your influences? You mentioned you played the saxophone. So who in the past who played saxophone had a huge influence on you? To be perfectly honest, uh, my biggest influence was my mother, uh, who was a seamstress, and she was a perfectionist. Just watching how she was not satisfied with a crooked line 
all of her work was just flawless and wanting to uh, have a part of that type of, um, what did you say, uh, that work ethic, that's what I wanted. And I wanted to be as good as she was of a seamstress. I wanted to be that good as an instrumentalist. And so she was probably my first influence. And then later on, there was um, a gospel saxophonist that was from Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, he went to Sumner High School. I had no idea where Kansas City was at that time in my life. Uh, but his name was Bernard Johnson. He was a great gospel saxophonist. And my aunt had one of his records in her house. And uh, they tell the story uh, from time to time at family reunions. We were running through the house playing and they were playing music and I just stopped in my tracks. And I was like, who is that? And she said, that's Bernard Johnson. So what is he playing? He's playing the saxophone. And so at that point, I was on the quest to figure out what a saxophone was, what it looked like. Da, da, da. And so that was, to me, like the beginning of my saxophone quest, I guess. Wow. So speaking of Kansas City, you didn't really know where it was or much about it at the time. You were younger. But when you got older, you found your way to Kansas City. I did. It was, it was actually an accident, I would say. Um, I was transferring from a school in Texas, and um, I wanted to either live in New York or Chicago. And um, I went to visit uh, a friend at the time, and um, from there came to visit Kansas City, where one of my first saxophone teachers was living at the time, uh, Todd Wilkinson. and. Um, he said, come on down and visit. We'll take you around and you get a chance to, you know, meet a lot of cats and da 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 you know. So came on down, spent about a week, week and a half here in Kansas City, met a lot of people. And it was so close to where I was from in that it feels like a small city, a big town, but it's much bigger than where I'm from. Uh, but it still had that homey feeling. People were very, very nice. And the scene was very vibrant. I loved it and um, just started me on my quest of learning more about the elder statesmen and the ones that were still alive. I wanted to uh, learn more about their influences and what things were like when they were coming up. And uh, it was a great, great um, experience. So tell me a little bit about coming to the Jazz Museum and what you do here. And you have been here over 20 plus years. So you've seen a lot of musicians come and go. You programmed a lot of musicians in the Blue Room and other spaces for some of the Jazz and Blues festivals. Um, what do you do here? What do you contribute? Because I know you contribute a lot. Well, when I came here, I was just a baby. Just a baby. Let me say 20 years. I'm 37 now. So no elder statesman jazz title for you right now, right? Oh, none of that for me here, yeah. buddy. No. Um, the trek to the jazz museum. Of course, everyone knew about the jazz museum going up. You know, we would drive by saying one day, because you could see the, uh, when they broke ground, you could see the construction starting and everybody was excited about that. And then, Later on, you see the structure going up, and everybody's happy, da 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 At the time, I had left Kansas City and uh, moved to New York, and I was living there, uh, touring with uh, and playing with different bands. But one of the bands of note was Illinois Jaquette. He was one of my favorite, favorite people. Uh, he was out of the Texas tenor family. He played with Count Basie. He played with... Ellington. He played with all of the greats, Milt Jackson. I mean, the list goes on for him, but he had his own voice. As a matter of fact, he played the, uh, the famous solo he played on Flying Home with Lionel Hampton. So people talked about that for years before I had a chance to meet him, but I met him at the International Jazz uh, Hall of Fame um, 
event. And uh, he pulled me out and said, hey, I want you to come to New York and play with my band. And I, you believe in being, in a, being an apprentice? I was like, apprentice? What? No. Yeah, but I didn't understand exactly what he was talking about, and I thought he was joking. But I did move to New York and played with him. Um, I copied music for him. I got his, uh, some of his books together, recopied uh, parts anything that I could uh, do to be in his presence. He introduced me to Milt Hinton. He introduced me to a lot of the guys that lived in his community in Queens, uh, New York. But the year before I came to uh, the Jazz Museum, we were on tour for the whole month of, I believe it was June or July, in the south of France. So. That opened up a lot of a lot more opportunities. I was meeting a lot of other musicians that were from New York, and when you're out on the road um, and meeting guys, you form like these bonds, and people remember like if something wasn't going great, you know, you know, you were there when it wasn't good. If it's going great, you were there when it's so you form these bonds with people, and so uh, I was getting a lot of compliments. So I was saying, so, man, when we get back to New York, man, let's hook up, man. Da, da, da. So I had a chance to connect with uh, Bill Lee. I would play uh, like a lot of his reading bands, who's the uh, father of Spike Lee. Um, several other people that I won't name right now because I don't want to sidetrack myself. I want to get back to how I got to the Jazz Museum. But the relationships that I was forming at that time seemed to be very promising to me. And uh, we came for the jazz camp that was started by Congressman Cleaver, then uh, Mayor Cleaver. It was a program where we would bring kids in to um, learn about music and the musical heritage of Kansas City. They would actually get paid, you know, to participate. So um, there were a lot of kids that wanted to, wanted to participate. We were having a great time this particular summer, and I'll never forget Louis Neal coming to me saying, hey, Gerald, they're going to have a jazz club inside the Jazz Museum. Uh, would you like to be a part of uh, that? And I was like, eh, no, going back to New York. And um, so fast forward to the end of the camp, um, he came back again and said, hey, man, I'd like for you to meet the director of the American, Je- well, the Kansas City Jazz Museum at that time, Rowena Stewart. And I said, uh, sure. Didn't know that they had basically uh, stacked the decks on me. So it was Rowena Stewart. Congressman Cleaver just happened to be, or Mayor Cleaver just happened to be in the vicinity at the time. And uh, Lewis said, well, we're going up to talk to Rowena about uh, the jazz club. And he said, oh, yeah, okay. So he came on over as well. And so Lewis said, uh, well, here's Gerald Dunn. Here's the guy that I was talking to you about. He said, well, he's just a kid. And I was a smooth chin <laughs> kid at the time. But um, I did not know um, everything that would go into booking the club. I thought it was just call some guys up, tell them you got a gig, and boom, and then I could go back to New York. She said, no, you would have to live here. You can't do this while you're in New York. You have to live here in Kansas City, and uh, you, have to, you have to be here to do it. And Lewis was like, oh, man, it's going to be great, man. You're going to love it. But it didn't sound good to me because it had nothing to do with playing my instrument. And at the time, that's all I wanted to do. I would practice six, seven, eight hours uh, a day, you know, just it, that's what I wanted to do and playing with my friends. And uh, the thought of not going back to New York to me was just, it was, it was not, nothing that I was trying to even hear at the time. And so I thought that I would call my parents and let them know. And um, so I called 
uh, my mom, we were talking. She said, hold on, let me get your dad because we've been trying to get in contact with you. And uh, yeah, he's got a few things he needs to talk to you about. And I said, well, great. I have a few things I want to talk to you guys about. And so I explained um, the situation to them. And I was like, and I really don't want to stay in Kansas City. I want to go back to New York. My dad just jumped right in and said, well, I can help you make that decision. Um, you have no more times to call to borrow money from me. Uh, I think that'll help you make that decision. And I said, well, Mom, uh, she said, well, I think this is where I back out of the conversation. Your dad has a few things to talk to you about. And so his conversation talked to me about, um, well, what he said was, you need to spend more time in one space, in one place. You're going all over the country. Every time you call us, you're calling from some other place. And uh, that's great and it's good. But you need to sit down, acquire some property. Um, and if New York is meant for you, it's not going anywhere. Go back. And um, about that time, my mom comes back and she says, why don't you take about two years? It'll take you about two years and figure it out. If you still want to go back to New York, I will help you. You go back to New York and we're going to make sure that you're able to do what you want to do. I should have known that uh, they had a plan great, uh, a plan that was greater than that. Uh, as a matter of fact, they uh, called and talked to uh, Dr. Stewart at the time. And um, yeah, they pulled one over on me. They really did. I ended up staying here for, as you mentioned, over 20 years. And it was because um, people cared about my future. At the time, I wasn't concerned about a 401k, but that was the first time I had a chance to establish a 401k. And it was because Dr. Stewart was inter interested in helping people to understand how to uh, establish. So, um, yeah, tell us more about um, the group that you play with here um, and, and lead. The Jazz Disciples? Yeah, the Jazz Disciples. Started out as uh, the Don Freeman Mix. Mm -hmm. The name uh, given to us by a guy by the name of Eddie Penrice, who was the nephew of uh, Eddie Baker, trumpet player, big band leader, Eddie Baker, big band. So um, we were looking for a name um, for a concert in the park one summer, and we were rehearsing Everett Freeman was my roommate when I first moved to Kansas City and was attending UMKC. And uh, we, were all, we would always play together, but whoever got the gig, that's whose name the band would be. in. Like if it was Everett that got the gig, it would be the Everett Freeman Quartet mm -hmm. or, you know, the Gerald Dunn Quartet. But this guy said, well, why don't you guys, so something that has both your names in it, the Gerald and Everett band, nah. Not at all. And so he said, why don't you be the Don Freeman band? No. Nah. How about the Don Freeman mix? Because we always mixed in like different people in the band. And at the time, since we needed it before, um, before we turned in all the information for all the parks department, we decided to go with that. And we, beca we became that uh, name for, until we changed it to the Jazz Disciples. And that name came from Bishop Mark Talbert, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, because we were getting ready to do a recording, and we wanted to change the name of the band, and uh, we were coming up with different names. And he said, "You know, um, you know, because uh, God speaks to me," <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, um, "Won't you guys? Won't you guys be the Jazz Disciples? That's a good name." And I was like. I am nowhere close to being a disciple. Yeah, that is very Christian. <laughs> very biblically based. And I just met uh, Bishop Talbert this past weekend at the American Walk of Fame. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great guy. And talk about an entrepreneur. He is like one of the world's greatest. But 
he helped us put together a, a recording project back then, and that's where the name uh, Jazz Disciples came from. I think the name helped us become more cohesive, helped us begin to think about how to sound like a unit, move like a unit, and yeah, that's that's what we did. We decided to use that and begin to understand different nuances about ourselves that created the voice of the band. And Very cool. Yeah, that's what we run with now. So you're able to play in the Blue Room and other venues with the Jazz Disciples. Then you're able to book talent for the Blue Room and kind of you know, oversee that. So that's very, that's, that's like a dream for a lot of people, right? To be able to do both of those things. It is a the dream. The best of both worlds. It is a dream. That was one of the things that um, was presented from the beginning. It said that you can perform every Monday because we're going to do Blue Monday Jam sessions. That's from the historic Blue Monday Jam sessions. It started a long time ago. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But no, you can play every Monday. And one time a weekend, I mean, once, one weekend out of a month. And uh, understanding the, uh, the climate and the jazz scene at the time, I'd mentioned to them, I said, well, why don't I play one Monday out of the month and one weekend night out of the month? So there'll be two times a month. And uh, Lewis Neal turned and said to Dr. Stewart, this is why he's the guy that I think should take the job okay. because he's always trying to figure out how to include other people. Um, but I knew the uh, state of the jazz scene at that time. And there was a lot of um, disagreements and a lot of people at odds with each other. And so we started calling the jam sessions, our fellowship. And we would invite the elder statesmen out and we would hang with them have the young cats hang with them. And sometimes they were brutally honest about, hey, what you played really sucked. That okay. was bad. But what they were really good at mm -hmm. was pulling you in to say, when you were coming out of the bridge of all the things you are, that 2-5 there, which is really difficult for everyone, if you isolate that and figure out ways to get into it and ways to get out of it, It'll help you in the transition of that song. It's the same thing with The Song Is You, same thing with Cherokee, all these songs that would give people uh, problems when you're at a jam session. And so they help to nurture a lot of young minds, a lot of musicians. And again, because they realized that if they didn't, there was we were not going to carry on that tradition of being strong musicians. So they made sure of that. Um. Coming back to the, the opportunity to book entertainment, yes, it allowed me to see so many different bands, to see where they are, where they were in their development, um, the things that I could take away from that to be better, um, learn a lot about how to run a band, how to uh, talk to people on the stage. So there were a lot of perks that came along with that that really had nothing to do with booking bands, but just being in the room while everybody was performing and watching people starting to play together. I would purposely put bands together of people that did not get along, but since it paid well, they would come and play in the band. And it was just great to see those relationships start to open up and blossom. And people look at the development of the musical scene as opposed to focusing in on the development of themselves, you know. Okay. And so we open, we open things up. Mm -hmm. Black musicians playing with white musicians because there were some clubs and still are clubs that don't hire black people. I mean, mm -hmm. people don't talk about it, but it happens. And but here we made a point to hire black musicians and white musicians and encourage younger musicians to seek out 
people that they liked and try to in, um, be a part of the band or be a part of what they were doing uh, so that you can actually understand what it takes to perform on this particular level. I'm not saying that um, we present all of the best musicians, but we present the people that have a certain pride for what they do. And they support the American Jazz Museum, which was another piece of the puzzle. If you wanted to be a part of what we do here, then you need to come in and um, support. Not saying that you need to drink, Mm -hmm. but if you came in, uh, there was a time that I remember Ida Macbeth coming in after one of her gigs at Jardine's, which was down on the plaza. And I forget who was performing, but uh, the person turned and said, Ida Macbeth, ladies and gentlemen, Ida Macbeth. And she was standing on that wall over there. And um, I happened to hear this lady say, I've seen her name several times, but I've never met her before. And um, that was their first time seeing Ida Macbeth. And it was because she bought into the idea of coming out and supporting the musicians at their gigs here at the, jet, at the, uh, at the museum. And so, um, yeah, I learned so much more than just booking a band and, and being able to play in a space. It was, it was part of a culture that we try to, uh, try to uh, influence other people to participate in now. So tell me, what would you consider your big break? I think that when you talk about the big break, there are a series of breaks that you have. And each one of those are monumental or the big break in that chapter of your life. So I think it's a series of them. You have to make sure that you're prepared and ready to accept the challenge. And most people that are uncomfortable with where they are and looking for something, they're looking to continue to be better uh, or feel that there's something just beyond the horizon. Those are the ones that accept the challenge and they continue to experience one big break after the other. I think I agree with you. Yeah, I think yeah. I agree with you. Mm-hmm. So that's that's very prof- I think that's very prof- profound. Um so um I'm really interested in um the the concept of the blue room in terms of it being um named after a historic venue in the past. Uh we know that the original blue room was in the 18th and Vine area, perhaps at the corner of 18th and Vine and was owned by Reuben Street. And it was in his street hotel. So, um, you know, when, when we talk about the olden days and, and, you know, some of the folks that were here, they talk about how it was nothing to see Billie Holiday or um, Count Basie or someone or Duke Ellington, you know, in the hotel and um, probably in the Blue Room. But uh, here in our Blue Room, which is an exhibition space and a live performance venue, We've had some of those contemporary icons in the space. I'm meaning Prince. Can you tell us about the time Prince stopped by the Blue Room? No, um, the Blue Room, um, yeah, it's had a share of famous people, that's for sure. And like you mentioned, Prince was one of those iconic moments for us here um, to the point that his security team came out to surveil the space and to choose where uh, they roped off the room and they had roped off about more than half the room and said, no one can come to this area. And I was like, man, you cr- we're a place of business unless you guys are going to like uh, pay for uh, the drinks that we're not going to be able to sell that night with all these people stacked in here. Then no, oh, we have, as a matter of fact, the police is stationed right across in the building, uh, right, right across the street. And there is no more security uh, than that. And so he said, uh, well, when Prince comes, we're going to section off this area then. And I was like, okay, cool. But Prince came in and it was like, at that time, the windows um, on the top level 
and the windows uh, at the stage was open. So you could see okay. inside the space. Oh, wow. And when you're looking outside, just people were lined up outside, craning their necks, looking inside, trying to see Prince. His whole band came. Uh, everybody participated in the Monday night jam session. And uh, I'll never forget, I was at the soundboard and Prince came down and said, because uh, uh, his one of his saxophone players, uh, Michael Phillips, was playing. And uh, he said, um, um, could you turn his microphone up a little bit? I said, nah, man, he plays on the same mic that everybody else in the session does. This is Kansas City Jam session. He had to do what we do. Okay. Everybody does here. Uh -huh. This is Kansas City, man. He said, hmm. Kansas City. I said, you brought them down to get the Kansas City experience, man. That's what you did. That's what they're going to get. So you weren't afraid to say that to Prince? No. This is Kansas City. This is, this is uh, they, came to Kent, they came to our jam session. Well, he probably respected you more by you saying that than if you hadn't. I think he did because he was looking for a guitar to play. He wanted to play a guitar. The guitar that they had wasn't, he didn't want to play that particular one. But it was funny because uh, I went down and went to shake his hand and he, he pulled his arm back and said, I'm not shaking hands now. <laughs> and I said, what the? <laughs> what? This is before uh, COVID <laughs> and everything. Because back then, you know, everybody was still dapping it up and everything. I thought I was about to dap up Prince. And he was like, I'm not shaking hands now. And so <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. But uh it was uh it was it was a great time. Phenomenal musicians. Uh Candy Dolfer uh uh was playing in the band. Maceo Parker was up here. Maceo didn't come down and play, but everybody else did. And Candy came down and she said, You know what? Man, you guys here really love Kansas City. And I'm so happy to be here to be a part of it. And you know, my dad is a saxophone player. And he's got that big Texas sound, like like you have. And I was like, and I didn't know her dad played saxophone, but uh -huh. it's just Kansas City is known for its jazz heritage, and it's real. It's real, and the only way it can be real is when people come in and they realize that they have to get with you. You don't come in and change the program. So we, and the bar has been high in Kansas City. People move to Kansas City because there's opportunity. And um, I'm pretty sure he recognized that night that if any of his musicians were not able to make the concert at then Sprint Arena, um, he could have chosen people from here to come in and uh, jump in and not miss a beat, you know. But um, I think from that moment on, it helped a lot of people realize um, how important the Blue Room or the, the Jazz Museum uh, is to the tapestry of Kansas City. I mean, you can no longer say just 18th and Vine because the Streets Hotel, yes, it, it was on the corner of, of Paseo and 18th Street inside the Streets Hotel. But that was only one club that provided work and was the cutting ground, well, the, the fertile ground for so many musicians. And that's why musicians were so great from Kansas City. It was because of the playing opportunities. People talk about how great Charlie Parker was. It was mm -hmm. because there were so many places to play. You could play all the time. And that's what you have to have. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in the uh, Bible, if you believe in uh, the Bible, that says that to be a musician, you have to do it by day and by night. There was no, there's no, none of this part-time stuff. Mm -hmm. you, if you're in it, you have to be in it. That's the way it becomes a part of you. Your instrument is an extension of your body, you know. And so you have people now that believe, they believe that. Mm -hmm. And so as the museum starts to really move into the next phase of who and what it is, 
you have people that believe in it. And so we have to be true to what we say and true to what we do in terms of how we present the things that are going out. Because these guys are, they believe this. People are moving here from all over the nation just to be a part of this. They're moving here every month. You mentioned Jay McShann, who was one of the earliest performers to perform here at the Jazz Museum. And then we have his piano in our permanent exhibition. So tell me a little bit about Jay McShann and your relationship with him. Um, I'll tell you, uh, one of the funniest stories to me was because I, I was one of the few musicians who could go to his house, hang out, talk. And uh, his wife at the time, Marianne, would, would allow, us to, allow me to come over and hang out. And a lot of times the museum would use me as uh, a guinea pig to uh, go and ask him a question about coming to perform or something like that. But I went over one day, <laughs> one day and uh, I walked in and he said, yeah, yeah, Brad, I'm glad to see you here today. You, um, yeah, you, you got in the car. I said, uh, you sound just like him. He said, what do you have in the car? Um, and I would always have, and I know I probably shouldn't say this, but I would always have some juice in the car uh, with me. And so uh, he would say, uh, well, let's head on outside, Dad, Jill, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, I'll tell Marianne we're going to get some juice. I'll be right back. And so uh, <laughs> uh, we'd be outside for so long, and she would come up, Jay, Jay. <laughs> it's time for you to come in for dinner. Gerald has got to go home. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and he would uh, sit there and say, he said, don't say anything. And uh, so, Jay, did you hear me? It's time for you to c- come inside. Gerald has to go home. And um, he said, don't say anything. And then uh, um, I would say, but man, she's going to be mad at me because she's thinking that I'm keeping you out here. He said, yeah, but um, she thinks I can't hear. So I don't want to ruin it. And so uh, I said, uh, Mary, he's on his way, Mary. Gerald, will you let Jay know it's time for him to go? I know he can't really hear that well. <laughs> so, yeah, that was to me was a real funny. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Well, you, you are uh, very lucky to have known some of those elder statesmen, famous not so famous uh, to the world, but nevertheless have contributed to the jazz tradition and its, and its history. Um, I really thank you for being on this podcast. I'm excited to be at the helm of the podcast. All right. I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think it's a great thing for the jazz museum. And I do too. I think if we don't capture a lot of these great stories that people have, then uh, it's like, a tree falls in the forest. Can anyone hear it? You know, that kind of thing. So you can hear people say, there was this, there was this one time, but if they never have a chance to talk about it, uh, it just dissipates and we don't have it anymore. And there's, there are a lot, of, a lot of great stories, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of these great stories from the Big Break podcast. Me too. At the American Jazz Museum, where jazz lives. Thank you for tuning in to an episode of the Big Break Podcast. Now be sure to like, review, and subscribe to the Big Break on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. We also want to thank Missouri Humanities. Their financial support helps us in connecting Missourians to the people, places, and ideas that shape society. So stay connected for more incredible conversations from the American Jazz Museum, because this is where jazz lives.